President Donald Trump. Should he send you a thank you note? <laughs> Trump, he definitely didn't send us a, he called us a failing pile of garbage, so that was his thank you note. <laughs> Tell me about the Nike personal ID story. It's really how my career started. You know, I was a school teacher in New Orleans, and I went to MIT to do educational technology. Then I was procrastinating writing my master's thesis, and I had heard that Nike had just launched a service where you could personalize your shoes called Nike ID. And so I tried to personalize a pair of Nikes with the word sweatshop just to see, like, is Nike going to send me a pair of shoes that say sweatshop under the swoosh? And the next day, I got an email that said the word sweatshop is inappropriate slang, and we can't put them on the shoes. And we had this back and forth where they were kind of talking around the issue. And then eventually, they said, look, we reserve the right to not put that ID on the shoes, and you need to change the ID. And I said, OK, I'll change the ID, but can you at least send me a picture of a 10-year-old Vietnamese girl who stitches the shoes together? And then they didn't write back. This was in January of 2001, before Facebook, before YouTube. Nobody thought of things going viral back then. And so I sent it to like 12 of my friends, and they started forwarding it to their friends. And I started getting all these emails back from strangers. Then I started getting calls from reporters who wanted to write this David and Goliath story of a student standing up to Nike. And it was because I made something that people thought was worth sharing. And so that got my mind thinking about how does this new networked environment influence the way information spreads? And then BuzzFeed really is the purest expression of that, of build a media company, news and entertainment from the ground up, focused on people being the distribution and what people care about being the way that you reach an audience. Why do you think there's so much animosity towards the press? I think there's two things going on. The media had got very comfortable being a gatekeeper, telling people what to think. And so when there was only three channels or only a few major news outlets, it often meant that people weren't getting their stories told, people weren't being served as well as they could be by a more open press. And so the public feels like the media is not telling them everything, the media is sanitizing everything, and that's partly why, even before Trump, trust in the media had really declined a lot. I think Trump then exploited that feeling by saying, I'll speak directly to you. I'll tweet what's going on. I'll tell you what the media is not telling you in an authentic voice with typos in the tweet, with having imperfect turns of phrase that felt like he made it up on the spot. And that feeling of humanness and authenticity to people who were susceptible to Trump's message was very powerful. Because even though in many cases the factual information was false, it felt true. It felt like it was cutting through all the mediation and artifice. There's a desire for actual truth, but then there's also a desire for something that feels like truth, that's the style of truth, that feels human. And I think the traditional media has, in some cases, gotten complacent and think that they don't need to listen to their audience, that they know better what people should hear. And that creates an opening for Trump or anyone who will speak in an authentic sounding voice and going directly to the audience. Before inauguration, a report surfaced claiming Russia may be keeping possibly salacious secrets on then-president-elect Donald Trump. These claims came partly from a former British intelligence agent's 35-page dossier. CNN did not print it or quote from it, but BuzzFeed did. Was this a violation of journalistic ethics? Some media critics supported BuzzFeed, but many, many did not. I think it's a disgrace that information that was false and fake and never happened got released to the public. As far as BuzzFeed, which is a failing pile of garbage, writing it, I think they're going to suffer the consequences. They already are. How does it feel when the president of the United States calls your company a failing pile of garbage? Well, we, uh, within three hours, had made t-shirts and uh, a lot of uh, BuzzFeeders feel a lot of pride wearing the failing pile of garbage t-shirt. Tell me about 
the dossier and the decision to publish it. The dossier was a report on Donald Trump's connections that was most likely paid by a political opponent of Trump's in order to, to say, what, what do we know about um, Trump's connections with Russia that, that may be compromising to Donald Trump as a candidate? John McCain got a copy of the dossier, and he gave it to the head of the FBI. President Obama and the president-elect had been briefed on the contents of the dossier, but at that point, nobody in the public actually had seen it or knew what was in it. Then CNN reported that there was this explosive document filled with allegations. At that point, BuzzFeed decided to publish the document, and through our reporting, we were able to find that two things in the document were clearly not true, and we corrected those things. And we also made it clear that we were unable to verify many things. Have you or BuzzFeed ever published uh, fake news? Have we ever published something false? Absolutely, and every news organization has, and that's why you have corrections, and that's why if you discover something is false, you are committed to correcting it. So we are upfront with our audience. We correct things when they know they're false. We take efforts to verify things when we are able to verify things. And if we can't verify something, we're open about the fact that we can't verify it. Do you think that some of what you pioneered with reblogging, with Huffington Post and BuzzFeed helped pave the way for President Donald Trump to be where he is today? I would say that if you talk to the people who lead the big tech platforms, they almost always think that everything they do is for good and makes the world a better place. And I think that it's very hard to know if that's the case. If BuzzFeed starts making content like signs you were raised by Asian immigrant parents that reaches millions of people who didn't have content made for them, that seems like an amazing thing. Did the alt-right try to take some of that and use it to build white identity or nationalistic identity? You know, perhaps. And anytime you put anything into the world, it inspires people and you can't control who it inspires and you can't control how they use it. But I think most people believe in human values. Most people want to have a good life for their family, connect with their friends, be able to prosper economically. Most people want to know that the information they're consuming is accurate and true and that they can count on it. And by the way, people in that center have different political views, but there's a big center that values very similar things. And I think that that center has gotten lost in some ways, but it doesn't mean it's gone forever. So I tend to be pretty optimistic about the world and pretty optimistic that all the challenges that we're facing will be able to address in the future.